Welcome back, listeners, to Two Broads Talking Politics. As usual, I am one of the broads, your host, Sophie, and I'm here with your co-host, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hey, everybody. And today's podcast is about the religious left in the United States. I think a lot of us who are interested in politics hear about the religious right a lot, but maybe not so much about the religious left. But especially in recent years, the religious left has become um, a force in politics. And so we are talking to a few other members of the religious left. I consider myself a member of the religious left as well to sort of learn a little bit more about the religious left and how people of left-leaning political persuasions come to their political beliefs through their faith traditions. So we have with us today uh, Scott Robinson. He's an interfaith minister and hospice chaplain. Welcome, Scott. Hi there. Thank you. And we also have Ryan Fordyce, who works in development at the Lutheran School of Theology at Chicago. Welcome, Ryan. Hello. Hello, and thank you for joining us, both of you. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Yeah, happy to be here. So my first question for both of you is if, if both of you could tell us a little bit about your faith journey and how that sort of matched up with your political beliefs. Have you always considered yourself a member of the, the religious left? Have you always had liberal viewpoints? Have you always considered yourself a Christian? Well, you know, before there was a self-identified Christian right, I'm not sure I thought of myself as the Christian left. I think, at least for me, Christian left defines itself as being not the Christian right. And I guess I, I grew up Christian, grew up in a Christian house. I'm still a Christian now. I spent 10 years teaching college music at an uh, evangelical university. And I used to tell my students, I don't like the expression, when I became a Christian, because I figure I was always a Christian, even when I was an idiot. <laughs> so but you, you, hear, you hear that a lot. But when I became a Christian, meaning, I guess, when you became intentional about your faith. But my faith has always informed my politics, which has always been uh, left leaning. but Really, until I'd, I'd say the end of my high school years when Reagan was elected, there was never, for, as far as I could tell, any such a dichotomy as religious left or religious right. When you say you didn't feel like there was a dichotomy, did you feel like there wasn't a whole lot of commerce between your, your faith and sort of your political beliefs? Or do you mean like you thought that everybody was of one political persuasion who was religious? No, what I, I guess... And of course, this is a long time ago. Um, I'm trying to remember being less than 20 years old, but <laughs> I I don't remember one's faith tradition being being necessarily associated with one's political positions. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was as diverse a thing as anything else. It doesn't seem to be that mm -hmm. until the moral majority and Jerry Falwell and and Ronald Reagan and the like came along and and defined a religious right as distinct from a religious left that I ever thought of myself as religious mm. left. Uh, how about you, Ryan? Yeah, I always like to blow my friends' minds who grew up in more conservative Christian households and like, had came around to a more Christian left uh, orientation in their college years and so forth uh, by telling them a true thing, which is that I honestly did not know that there was any public perception of Christianity as usually conservative until I was 18 years old. Uh, I, and, and then I have to, have to go back and think to myself, is that actually true? But it is. I had a friend who came up and said, you know, you really seem like you'd be a Republican. And I thought you were a Republican. And I was like deeply offended. <laughs> <laughs> I demanded that she why? And she said, well, you're so Christian and you are all spending time at church. So I just kind of figured you're a Republican. And it was like my world was turned upside down. It, was like, it doesn't make any sense because like Jesus and he's countercultural and <laughs> like hangs out with the pores. And like it, you know, it was like the least Republican figure I could imagine. And But that is part of because of the circumstances I grew up in. I, I grew up in a uh, I was a good liberal mainline Protestant kid in an ELCA Lutheran congregation. Uh, it was home to a bunch of seminary professors and a rotation of seminary students. So my faith was formed in this place that was pretty erudite and uh, international in its constituency and, you know, were liberal. But I didn't, 
I just took it for granted that our religious communities, Christian communities, were open and affirming to people in same gender relationships. And I took it for granted that women could be ordained leaders uh, in Christian churches everywhere. And it wasn't until later in life that I had learned I'd kind of grown up in this place that didn't look like all. That's really interesting that you say that because I my family has the same experience of people assuming things about our beliefs <laughs> based on the fact that we're Christians. And in fact, my husband, who's a minister, if he doesn't want to get into like the fact that people are going to react one way or the other when they find out what he does for a living, he says that he's a motivational speaker when people ask what he does. <laughs> if he doesn't feel like dealing with it, he'll be like, oh, I'm a motivational speaker because it's kind of true. He preaches. It's, it's just he that way he doesn't get like into discussions with people who suddenly they think they know everything about his politics. So (laughs) I feel you. (laughs) Yeah, Ryan, I think my, my experience growing up was somewhat similar to yours. I mean, I certainly knew Christians who were conservative, but I grew up Catholic and my family, my Catholic side of my family was, was all Democrats, you know, and it, it made sense to me that of course Catholics would be Democrats. That just made all the sense in the world. And it wasn't until much, much later that the Catholic side of my family started to have a lot of problems sort of reconciling the the different things they believed as Catholics that didn't line up with what they believed as Democrats. But certainly being Republican didn't make sense either. And so it was this sort of weird disconnect for them. So I I didn't grow up thinking that all Christians were Democrats, but I certainly grew up thinking that that was a perfectly normal thing. I guess when it comes right down to it, I'm a little uneasy with, with labels like Christian right or Christian left. I mean, for instance, speaking of growing up Roman Catholic, my understanding is that uh, leading up to Obergefell, uh, the Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage, uh, United States Catholics supported marriage equality at a higher rate than the general population. So mm-hmm. I think it's 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 misleading to try to push people either onto one side of the aisle or the other based on faith tradition, because mm-hmm. people are very complicated. I mean, I've been a lot of people who were in favor of marriage equality were against abortion or were uh, big Dorothy Day fans or embarrassed by Dorothy Day or who knows. I mean, it's, 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 people are complicated. That's my contrarian answer. <laughs> yeah, it's also interesting because the Catholic Church has traditionally been what we would think of as more conservative on on sort of social issues, but they've always been very interested in helping the poor and in Do I even want to use the phrase redistribution of wealth? Sure. Like they've always been very into sort of social justice issues in terms of economic justice. So it's hard to sort of pin down the Catholic church in that way. I think it's funny how worked up people are getting about Pope Francis. They seem to have forgotten how interested John Paul II was in economic justice Mm -hmm. and in um, his anti uh, adventurism in Nicaragua, for instance. He didn't want us in Nicaragua and El Salvador either. Um, but we've forgotten all that. We remember him as a champion of quote-unquote traditional family values and have forgotten how what, what a rash he gave Congress with his encyclicals on social justice. So I want to come back really quickly to something we just talked about, which was marriage equality. I know that the Christian left and the religious left in general had a really big influence in the relatively rapid social acceptance of marriage equality in the United States in like the past 20 years. Uh, I know specifically in New York, uh, the religious left and specifically the Christian left was very influential in passing the original state bill to allow marriage equality in the state. I know this because I was in New York at a seminary at the time. (laughs) Ah. And so I saw it and I read all of the articles in the New York Times about it. But uh, the religious left had a really big impact on that particular issue. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about why do we think that the Christian left had a strong influence on that issue? And what other issues do you think the Christian left is influencing today? So I'll jump in with a thought. And it relates to the kind of the posture that Scott was describing that I, that I, that I too have a little bit of, I find myself struggling with, you know, the 
the posture of that there's this kind of the Christian right as this thing that everybody knows and the Christian left, as, if we're going to call it that, has to has to have this sort of insurgent uh, or you know defining itself against the dominant understanding of Christianity in the United States. But I think mm -hmm. these moments where cultural change is happening, that posture actually becomes advantageous because there's a certain power and a certain attention grabbing ability in having religious leaders or you know religious groups of people speaking with the authority of the tradition saying we believe this thing whether it's marriage equality or uh, if we want to discuss other issues uh, we believe that we have a moral underpinning for this thing especially when uh, a lot of the narrative people are hearing you know when it, when it was prop 8 in california and other things elsewhere uh, when you're getting large amounts of Catholic or Mormon money uh, to try to advance things that were going to push a mar push marriage equality backwards, to have Christians standing on equally <laughs> equally Christian principles, uh, saying no, we believe that this is part of God's vision for creation. We believe that this is uh, the very love that we are instructed to share with one another, uh, and these other things are not that that insurgent quality gets a lot of attention and can move the needle a little bit and change the conversation. It's not one side is we are the religion side and the other side is we are the anti-religion side. It's no, religion is nuanced and we're over here with, with an opinion that's going to move the argument a little bit. Do you think that there's something specific about the marriage equality debate that is somehow sort of fundamentally different from something like abortion or the death penalty or something, some other issue on which you might find religious people weighing in? Is there something about marriage equality because it is not an issue of life and death? It's not an issue of, it's still an issue of people's bodies, of course, but I, I just, I wonder if there's something about the framing of that that gives it a little more of that space for it not to be sort of quite as polarizing uh, in terms of there being room for religious faith to say, we accept this and we think that this is important and, and part of what we believe. Well, it's funny you say framing. I think framing is key. Um... I read about a, uh, a study, and I, I can't, I'm afraid I can't cite specifics on this off the top of my head. It was a few years ago, a, a, a survey came out asking the question, do you believe gay men and lesbians should be allowed to serve openly in the military? Another version of that same study asked, do you believe homosexuals should be able to serve openly in the military? Hmm. And depending on whether the words gay men and lesbians or homosexuals was used, the, it skewed the outcome 15%. 15% of people changed their minds, in other words, about whether that should be allowed, depending on whether you said gay men and lesbians or homosexuals. So I think a, an awful lot of this is about framing. I mean, I understand why so many churches in Philadelphia are picketing gun shops. And I understand why we're demonstrating for you know, free and fair funding for schools and for living wages. And I even understand the pro-life position. I do not understand any of the urgent state needs arguments people make in favor of discrimination in marriage. It, it, it seems to be 100% about framing and about one social, one social vision prevailing over other social visions. I don't see how, I think framing has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you if you think about it as people and as marriage, it's very different than thinking about sex, right? Sex is something, mm -hmm. bodies are something that seem to be particularly charged in the religious right, you know, especially women's bodies, you know, in, in a way that if you're talking about marriage, if you're talking about love, you can sort of spin that a little to be not it, it's still about people's bodies and people's choices about their bodies, but it's also about their choices about love and, you know, as religious.